Okay, welcome to the fifth session of the forum on Earth Science New Map. Uh, my name is Rasul Sarkabi. I uh, work for the University of Utah. I have been at the University of Utah for the past um, 18 years or so. So today we are going to discuss this topic, post-corona oil industry, emerging divides and the place of geoscience. Now, we will have some time for Q&A at the end of uh, my talk. So you can post your questions or comments in, in the chat box, or we can discuss it you know, later after the presentation. So this is the title of the talk. Um, I think it's very timely um, and a very important uh, given the situation that the oil industry is in. Uh, so I hope we will uh, share some um, ideas and, and some information about um, what is happening uh, to the oil industry and uh, the various trends that it's taking at this particular time. Now, um, the picture which you see is a view of the Wasatch Mountain, Wasatch Range in Salt Lake City on the east side of Salt Lake Valley. So this is where the University of Utah is located. Um, I have been uh, a research professor at the Energy and Geoscience Institute, EGI, uh, which was founded in 1972. This was during the first oil shock. So we are one of the largest research institutes um, for the industry um, located in an academic setting. So this year is our um, 48th anniversary. You can visit the website, um, EGI Utah website, you know, to get more information about what we do. Now, all these rocks which you see here, especially these red rocks, they are all uh, they are Jurassic sandstones, very important reservoir rocks in Wyoming and also in Utah. Um, in Southwest US. So we are really lucky to have access to important, you know, reservoir formations in our backyard. Now I should acknowledge uh, the previous speakers um, in this forum. Um, we have had, so this is the fifth session, but in the past we have had four other speakers. Um, Margie Chan, University of Utah, she gave a presentation, the first presentation on geoconservation. Then Mike Simmons, Halliburton, um, he gave an excellent talk on hydrocarbons, geoscience, and the energy transition. Uh, Sharon uh, Mosher, uh, she gave a talk on November 7th on geoscientists' workforce and especially education and students for the future. Last time, uh, my good friend Sid Green, he gave uh, a very comprehensive uh, presentation on the technology that is needed um, for economic improvement in the unconventional oil and gas recovery. And I am kind of following up the previous speakers in terms of um, projecting what's happening uh, somewhat to the future to look at some trends. I should also uh, share this disclaimer with you. I am sure you are all aware of this. All these discussions are taking place in an academic setting. We are not giving, you know, any of the speakers, uh, including myself, we are not giving any financial advice. Now, this year I have published several articles. Um, I'm not going to um, into the details, but if you um, visit my website, uh, you have access to um, all these articles. Um, but today's topic 
is mostly based on this paper, which is in press in the oil industry history. This is an annual, more um, academic, I would say, peer reviewed journal published by the Petroleum History Institute in the US. And uh, the title of that paper is COVID-19 uh, pandemic, oil market crash and prospects for the oil petroleum industry. So this will come out um, in a couple of months. The picture which you see here, this is the golden driller. Um, those of you who have visited um, Tulsa in Oklahoma, uh, this stands in front of the Expo Center in Tulsa. This which was a venue for international petroleum exposition for many, many years. And this picture um, is a courtesy of uh, my friend, uh, Ray Sorensen who, Sorensen, who lives in Tulsa and it's on the cover page of um, this magazine. Um, also, um, this month, December, the APG Explorer has an article as a story on oil tech research goes beyond just big data. And I shared some of my thoughts in that article. It was written by a journalist, not me, uh, but some of the, the um, ideas that I'm sharing, they're also documented in that particular article, December issue of the AAPG Explorer. Now, I think one important question for all of us is to discuss, so why this oil crash is important at all? What is at stake? So I have listed several uh, reasons. One important reason is that the petroleum industry is one of the largest industries in the world. So it employs tens of millions of people in the world, both upstream and downstream. Now in the US last year, there were 145,000 full-time upstream workers, including geoscientists and engineers employed by the oil companies. But the total impact of the petroleum industry goes beyond uh, upstream. So there are some estimates that as uh, many as 7 million jobs are supported by the oil industry uh, in the US. So that's about 5% of the total uh, employment in the US. So that is huge. And also oil prices affect banks and investors. Uh, this is very important. So if we have prolonged low um, oil prices, then that will affect the lending banks, investors, and many other enterprises which are related directly or indirectly with oil. And one important uh, portion of this is retirement funds because traditionally um, retirement funds have been invested in, in the oil industry. So when the oil prices go down, when there's oil market crash, that also affects uh, retirement funds. Um, also, there are other um, services and commodities which are sensitive to oil. Um, as you know, oil is not simply fuel. Uh, tens of thousands of petrochemical um, products uh, and also medicines, like two thirds of our medicines come from hydrocarbons. So, and many, many other uh, products are sensitive to oil prices. And also when there is oil market crash, the oil companies suffer financially. So this year alone, they cut back on tens of billions of dollars uh, of their you know, budget on uh, almost uh, on exploration, on you know, R&D, et cetera, et cetera. So that also affects the future uh, supplies and the future activities of the industry. Also petro states, uh, there are lots of countries in Asia, in Africa and South America who depend on oil revenues, um, especially this year, they need all what they can 
uh, you know, get uh, to fight the uh, pandemic. And also there are many other economic, environmental, you know, immigration issues in those countries. So when the oil prices are down, so that also affects uh, the oil producing countries in the developing um, parts of the world. And also universities, you know, um, I come from a university background. Um, traditionally, the petroleum industry has supported universities. Uh, the industry has employed a huge um, portion of both geoscience and also engineering graduates. And they have also supported um, a large number of research consortia. So universities also suffer in different ways from the oil market crash. Now, when we are talking about the oil market crash, so our perspective could be short term or long term. So the short term perspective is really related to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has brought about economic recession this year. So that is the short term perspective. And uh, the implication is that once the pandemic is over, once we have a medical solution for the virus and economic activities pick up, then the oil prices will naturally also rise. Um, here, what you see uh, are the oil prices, uh, prices for Brent and the, um, WTI, West Texas Intermediate, only for the month of November and early part of December, from November 1st through December 2nd. And the reason I am showing these diagrams um, is because early November we had uh, the presidential election in the US. And then soon after that, there were some news, uh, good news, promising news about the possible uh, vaccines, successful vaccines for the COVID-19. And within a week, you know, the oil prices jumped from about $38, $39 to $46 to $47. So that shows uh, that the COVID-19 has really played a huge factor in lowering oil prices. And once you know, as I mentioned, if once you know the market feels that there uh, is a medical solution um, is coming, then uh, the prices will pick up to some extent. Now, how the oil market will recover? There are several scenarios. I am only showing you a snapshot of you know a couple of articles I have written. So it could be an asymmetric V recovery. So far, the trend of the prices support this, but it's also possible that we may have a prolonged U recovery or uh, rapid fluctuations because of the corona, the waves of the pandemic or because of the price wars, etc. So uh, it's also possible that the market will uh, see this W very volatile situation. There are also some um, scenarios which predict higher oil prices after the pandemic, just because the oil industry has shrunk. And uh, once the consumption goes back to um, 100 million barrels a day or so, as we had last year. So for a very brief uh, time interval, we may have actually we may actually see a huge jump in oil prices. Or uh, in contrast, we may really experience low oil demand because of non-oil uh, energy resources uh, on the market. So we may experience very, very low oil prices for a long time. So it's very hard to really predict uh, these step changes uh, in the oil market but these are some of the uh, possible scenarios. Now, in terms of longer term um, perspective, um, now there is this um, huge discussion on energy transition to a low carbon economy. 
in the next three decades or so. And that has something to do with the um, global warming, climate change. So that is the main driver. Um, these are some different scenarios. So currently, you know, the total carbon dioxide emission is about 35 um, billion tons a year or so. So by 2040, depending on which trajectory the world takes, if it is a business as usual, then the carbon dioxide level will increase and the oil industry will be a big part of this. Um, or if the world really commits to the Paris um, agreement on climate change, then we will have less um, demand and for oil and also less oil production. Um, if the world wants to be very aggressive in terms of reducing the uh, emission of carbon dioxide to, let's say, if they want to keep the uh, temperature at two degrees Celsius, uh, I'm sorry, to, um, to keep the increase in uh, temperature to two, two degrees or 1.5 degrees, depending on the targets, we will have a huge uh, production gap. Uh, in oil production, fossil fuel production, I should say. So these are projected declines. We really don't know which one will really happen, uh, but these are different scenarios. This particular diagram comes from the French uh, uh, news agency, AFP. Uh, the, their um, synthesis is from various sources. And this partic particular graph comes from BP, uh, you know, in their Energy Outlook 2020, which, which was published this year. So they also have similar scenarios. So basically, uh, if these projections are correct, we will have some decline in oil production, depending on how aggressive uh, the companies, the energy companies and the world is in terms of reducing the um, carbon dioxide emissions. Now I use this word divides. Uh, this is, a, I would say a mild phase of what is happening in the oil industry. If this divides really uh, intensify, then maybe I should use a seismic line or fault line where different blocks go, uh, you know, different paths. And also we may have, um, we may feel the seismic um, shock from these divides. So right now, I, I prefer to use divides. So coronavirus has acted as a wedge, I should say. So it has created, and it is creating several divides in the oil industry uh, in relation to other sectors. And today, what I'm going to do is to review very briefly at these divides. There may be other factors also, uh, but uh, in the interest of time, I have uh, selected only a few factors here. The first important divide is between oil and money, financial uh, resources. So in pre-corona era, we had really a good coupling between oil and money. Uh, investors uh, overall trusted the um, longer term profitability of oil. So they invested uh, hugely, uh, especially like in, in the US, um, you know, there was a huge investment on um, shale. Now, post corona era, um, I think oil will compete for finance. It will not be that easy. And I will explain why. So to really attract uh, financial res you know, resources, or the oil industry will have to prove itself, will have to reinvent itself because it's going to compete against uh, you know, digital technologies, other commodities in the market. One important uh, 
uh, fact that we need to consider is that the structure, the financial, the monetary structure of companies are very different. For international oil companies, uh, they get their funding basically from structure holders, investors, banks, etc. So they owe, it, owe you know, lots of money, they have loans, uh, and once they make profit, they have to return some part of it to the investors. So this return on investment is very important. But national oil companies, they have a different uh, structure. Um, basically, they are tightly linked to the governments. They're, you know, respective governments. So once they have profits, then they transfer lots of it to the welfare system and also to the expenditures of the government. So the um, monetary structure between these two groups of companies are so different. And I think this will also show up in the next decade or so, um, these financial structures will somehow express themselves in their marketing, in their behavior. Having said that, when we look at the oil reserves, 90% of oil reserves are owned, they belong to the national oil companies and governments. So only 10% of oil reserves um, are handled by IOCs or independent oil companies, etc. So that's also another important factor. In terms of production costs, uh, of course, IOCs, they have high production costs per barrel just because uh, they are um, located in the Western countries and the economy is different. But uh, in developing countries, the national NOCs, they have very low production costs, uh, maybe a few dollars a barrel, but then they have a huge social overhead. So just like IOC, they cannot live with very low oil price market for long time. So um, that is also another factor to consider. And that also plays some role in the price fluctuations. Now, the reason that the oil um, industry will have to compete for finances, I think it's because of what happened in 2020. I'm sure you all remember on April 21st, the oil prices for WTI in, in North America, in the US, they fell below zero. So the oil was traded something like $38, minus $38 per barrel. So the sellers were actually paying $38 per, ba per barrel to the buyers to take their oil. So that somehow exposed this dichotomy that we had between physical oil that is handled by the oil companies and the paper oil that is handled in the stock market, exchange market, so, or commodity exchange market. So um, that will never be forgotten. Um, this was something unprecedented in the history of, uh, you know, oil industry. So. Um, that will make lots of investors very fearful uh, in the future as well. Um, now, even a Brent and OPEC basket, uh, they also fell to something like um, $15, $16 on the same day, but they did not go negative just because they have lots of shipping points, um, offshore shipping points in Europe and Asia, so, um, but WTI, because it's uh, only um, shipped from only one point, uh, Cushing, Oklahoma, so uh, there was uh, full um, inventories, uh, you know, there was no uh, surplus capacity for oil storage. But in any case, uh, this event, I think, really marks a turning point in, in the economy of, uh, oil, oil industry. So pre-corona oil funding, uh, I feel greed 
was a very important factor. That's why the oil industry could um, really attract lots of funding. I am averaging this, um, you know, uh, average for decades. But post corona oil funding, I think fear will be the main driver. So the financiers, the investors, the banks, uh, they want to ensure that they will not lose their money, that they will be some return on their investments. So I think these two different uh, scenarios, um, so 2020 uh, wedge basically um, changed this scenario uh, from greed to fear. Also, as you know, uh, there are lots of, uh, you know, grassroots and public movements on divestment, uh, you know, from fossil fuels, both in Europe and also in the US. Uh, so that is also an important factor uh, in terms of restricting uh, financial resources on oil. Now, it is very uh, probable that uh, in the post-corona um, oil industry, we will have lots of mergers and takeovers. Uh, this year, uh, we witnessed that Chevron basically bought, you know, Nobel only for $5 billion. Uh, that was it in shares. So that was a very easy takeover. And last year, you know, Oxy bought uh, Anadarko. So this trend will continue in terms of consolidation. Um, back in 2000, we witnessed uh, major mergers and takeovers and purchases. Um, and as you know, all these companies like ConocoPhillips, um, you know, Shell, Pencil, et cetera, BP bought Amoco and Arco, Chevron, Texaco, ExxonMobil. I think uh, in the next uh, two, three years, we will see similar, a similar wave of um, takeovers and um, mergers. But what is the implication of this oil versus money for geoscience and engineering? Well, in pre-corona industry, the industry really focused more on more barrels, more reserves, more oil. But from now on, uh, the key will be to reduce costs per barrel just because of shrinking uh, financial resources. So this will be a very important trend in the oil industry, how to reduce their costs per barrel. And this is where there, is a, there are a lot of great opportunities for both geoscientists and engineering uh, to contribute. For one thing, uh, the focus for the conventional oil exploration and production will be on easy oil in super basins, where we have traditionally lots of oil. Uh, so frontier basins will not be on the priority list on the portfolio very much, like Greenland, et cetera, et cetera. So Middle East, you know, West Siberia. So where we have this super basins, um, they will attract more attention. Um, and the key will be how to produce from uh, these uh, super basins at lower costs. Now, the implication for unconventional, especially uh, shale plates in the US, will be the same. Um, how to uh, locate, how to characterize the production sweet spots. Even though there are lots of shale plates and basins in the US, uh, but all of them, not all of them are the same. And even in the same basin, we have more prol prolific versus you know, less productive wells and areas. So I think that will be a very important trend in the shale oil industry. We, how to locate this production sweet spot so that they reduce their risks and uh, cost per barrel. 
This is where I think geoscience can play a very important role in terms of applying, or I would say it, devising a new petroleum system and prospect analysis for shale plays. Now, I'm not going to review all of this. Uh, I published this graph in uh, GeoExplorer early uh, this year. Um, basically, we need to evaluate each and every element and process which goes into the petroleum system and then and quantify that for uh, shale plays. In that way, we, geoscientists can uh, locate and also characterize sweet spots. The other trend which we will see uh, is this change, a shift from this old paradigm. Uh, we had this workflow of petroleum geology first and then production engineering. But that is going to change because to reduce the cost, there should be a linkage and also interaction between geoscience and engineering. So we will see more of this, uh, uh, more of petroleum geoengineering. So this will be a new paradigm in the industry, uh, which means that uh, future, you know, geoscientists and engineers, uh, they need to be able to talk, you know, to talk to each other, to understand each other and to collaborate. Uh, so that is also going to be an important pattern or trend. The sec second divide is between the US and OPEC plus. I am sure you have followed the news this year, you know, the rivalry and the uh, the price wars uh, between the US and OPEC plus and even within the OPEC plus, you know, between Russia and Saudi Arabia. Uh, this will uh, accelerate uh, just because they, you know, OPEC plus temporarily uh, cut back on their production. It doesn't mean that this problem went away. Uh, so this will uh, continue for years to come. Um, and the important factor here is that uh, in the past, until 10 years ago or so, US was really a very important importer of oil, a very important market for OPEC. Uh, but because of the shale revolution, you know, US is emerging as a world, one of the top three world producers and also um, a potential exporter to Europe and to Asia. Now, OPEC Plus, uh, they are competing to keep their market share in the world. So this rivalry will continue. Um, although I should say OPEC's uh, power has diminished when it was founded in 1960, it, you know, there were only five founding members and they controlled 90% of the international oil trade. But two years ago, 2018, OPEC members had increased to 12 members, but even then they could only control 60% of international oil trade. So non-OPEC oil has increased um, in the, in the, since the 80s, I should say. I should say. Uh, but still, you know, OPEC is, is a big player, but not as important as, uh, you know, it was in, back in the 70s, for example, the first and the second oil shock. Now, this uh, figure comes from uh, EIA. It shows uh, top five crude oil producing countries, um, Russia, Saudi Arabia, US, uh, Iraq, and uh, Canada. As you can see in the past 10 years, really what has happened is this US shale revolution. That has been a, bit, uh, a game changer. Uh, the production of other members uh, has not really increased, um, you know, that much. The US production has doubled from five to 10 billion barrels a day or so. Um, so the U.S. shale revolution has been a big uh, factor, a big part of the uh, low oil market, uh, 
a low price oil market in the past 10 years or so. And um, that is also one reason for um, the price wars and uh, between uh, uh, shale, between US shale producers and also uh, uh, OPEC plus. Now, what can the US do? Um, I listed here four options. Um, again, you can uh, review, uh, you know, there are lots of details uh, of these different options in those articles. Uh, the first option is do nothing for the US. So let, you know, market forces basically adjust prices. And this will work to some extent. So when the oil prices are really low, uh, when they fall below break even points, then the oil companies will have to decrease their production to raise the prices. So that's one uh, possibility. The second option is to the traditional option to apply political pressure on especially Saudi Arabia because it's a very powerful US ally and also a major swing producer in the OPEC to increase or to you know, decrease oil production that would uh, keep the prices at levels that benefit the US economy. Or a major radical change would be that US joins OPEC plus just like Russia did as an observer and then negotiates the exports uh, of oil uh, how much oil, you know, the countries can export so that in that way, the prices are um, stabilized. Another radical uh, option would be for the US would be to decouple uh, the oil prices, um, the domestic oil prices and the international oil prices that are then decoupled. So the government would uh, set a domestic oil price, let's say $65 a barrel, that would really benefit the shale producers. And then if the international oil prices are below that, then the government would put tariffs on imported oil. So anyway, uh, that would also be very, a very confrontational uh, you know, approach. So all of these have their own pros and cons, and we don't have time really to review, uh, but US has several options actually to play. Now, the policy implication of this uh, rivalry uh, between or the wedge between the US and OPEC plus is that really today no country or no company can control oil prices or maybe for a short time, but not for a long time. So fundamental factors in you know, the supply and demand relationships, they are still, they still remain fundamental. So those are important. The other uh, takeaway lesson is that without the cooperation of all players, OPEC, Russia, and North America, oil market volatility will continue. So if there are no negotiations, you know, there are no production cuts, et cetera. Uh, so this volatility in the oil market will continue for years and for decades. Um, and also the third uh, lesson is that no country, including the US that imports or exports oil can isolate itself from the world economy and diplomacy. So oil diplomacy will be a very important part of the oil market. Now shale revolution for how long? As you know, the growth in the oil and gas production in the US in the past decade or so really hinges on shale, not so much conventional, right? So the conventional oil production peaked in 1971 or so. So it's really shale that is driving, that is uh, really, that's the engine for this growth. Um, but as a revolution, because like other, you know, all other revolutions, you know, it has to come to an end. So the end would be either uh, it fails or it is limited uh, to a few plays that started in the first place, or it becomes 
a mainstream uh, industry. It becomes a normalcy uh, in terms of technology. So uh, shale revolution, you know, will also evolve. Uh, you know, if it wants to survive and become a, a routine technology, so it has to evolve. Now, there are some issues. One is that shale wells, they have very rapid declining wells. And the drilling is like an assembly line, like a factory activity. So continuous drilling with, you know, of rapidly declining wells. So this is a major issue, as you know. The other thing is that so far the production, shale production is really limited to a few plays, to a few basins in the US. Shale revolution has not become global. You know, outside the US, you know, the countries either they don't have the infrastructure or financial resources, um, or because of real estate issues, they, they can't do uh, hydro, hydraulic fracking. So it is really, so far, it is really limited to a few basins, especially Permian Basin, you know, Bakken uh, and Eagle Fort uh, for oil, and then, uh, you know, Barnett, uh, you know, Anadarko Basin and Appalachian Basins for gas. Uh, so here, you know, technology will play a very important role in evolving and developing shale, especially along this lines. One is avoiding, you know, gas flaring, which is really a waste of time, uh, and money, and energy. And then reducing water in hydraulic fracturing, controlling induced seismicity, controlling fugitive methane, improving uh, recovery factor, because recovery factor for shale is really, really oil. Uh, less than 10% for oil and less than 20% for gas. And if you compare this with like 50% for oil for conventional resources and 80% for gas, again, conventional resources, it's very, uh, very, very low. So there are lots of areas that engineering and uh, geoscience can um, contribute. And also carbon capture storage uh, or usage will be a very important part of shale in the coming decades. So that's another area that science and technology can contribute. The third divide is what I call the Atlantic Rift between uh, North America, uh, companies like ExxonMobil, ConocoPhillips, Chevron, and Oxy, etc. They are still very much focused on oil and gas exploration, you know, business as usual. Uh, but, you know, companies like BP, ANI, Econor, Shell, etc. in Europe, now they are positioning themselves more as energy, you know, companies. Uh, they want to move um, you know, a little beyond oil and um, to have low carbon footprints, you know. So that rift is very important. So we really don't know how that will play out in the coming decades or so, but we see that wedge, we see that divide uh, this year between these two uh, groups of companies and they are all uh, international oil companies, right? Um, European companies uh, early this year, they already announced their vision for 2045, 2050. Uh, so it's a low carbon, footprint uh, economy for them. Um, now, on the US side, the companies, they have their own reasons to stay in the traditional oil and gas. So let's review them. One important thing is that this is their comfort zone. I mean, oil companies are not solar companies, they are not wind companies. So especially the oil industry, the modern oil industry basically uh, evolved in, in the US in 1860s or so. And these oil companies, they have been doing this for more than 150 years. So this is their comfort zone. Uh, the second uh, motivation for the uh, American oil companies is the shale oil revolution. Again, they created this revolution and shale now has uh, offered the prospect 
of energy independence for the U.S., something that was has been a dream, you know, for for all U.S. presidents, you know, since uh, Richard ne you know, Nixon, you know, just after the first uh, um, oil shock. So this is very important uh, for, for the U.S. We cannot ignore it. Also, the U.S. is the largest consumer of oil per capita. You know, the U.S. consumes like 25% of world oil. So it is not that easy to go beyond oil, you know, in a matter of like a few years or so. Now, this slide is a little bit old, like pre-election. Uh, you know, the U.S. left the Paris Agreement on Climate Change under, you know, President Donald Trump. But now with the new president, you know, um, the Joe Biden's presidency, this may change. Uh, but again, these two factors, comfort zone for the oil companies and also shale revo oil revolution and energy independence for the U.S. will remain very strong. Having said that, many U.S. companies, uh, major companies, uh, Chevron, etc., of course, they also want to decrease their carbon footprint. Uh, so carbon storage and uh, or, or usage will be very important uh, part of their you know activities, and like Europe, there is also a very strong anti-fossil fuel movement in the U.S. as well. So um, that divide uh, you know may actually shrink uh, as we as the industry and the energy evolves. Now the European side. They have a different picture. First, Europe really doesn't have much oil. Yes, historically, Romania and Italy, you know, they have had some oil production, or North Sea is a, a big part uh, for Norway, UK, etc. But, uh, you know, in 1999, uh, the entire proven crude reserves, you know, uh, uh, this is conventional in Europe was 21 billion barrels. 10 years later, last year, you know, it shrank to 15 billion barrels or so, and 60% of that is located in Norway. So the, Europe is so different from uh, US. Uh, the US has lots of oil. And also fracking in Europe is like fracking in New York. It's out of question. So we saw this in, you know, in, in, in England, you know, the, the, there are, you know, shale, lots of shale plays historically, but they are not going to uh, exploit them. They are not going to develop them. It's out of question for, you know, real estate, uh, you know, reasons, etc. cetera. Um, so Europe has all the reasons. They can gain a lot from decreasing their dependency on oil and gas from North Africa, from Russia, from the Middle East, etc. So they have very good incentives to do that. Uh, but the U.S. is a different, uh, you know, game. And also Europe is committed to the Paris Agreement, so that also uh, compels them to uh, move in that direction. And then the European companies are under pressure to adjust their activities to what's called social license to operate. Um, Again, you, you can review this uh, diagram, you know, uh, on the internet. Uh, but basically the companies want to make sure that they are acceptable to society, their activities, they're acceptable to society and also to their investors so that they can uh, operate in a healthy manner. Now, um, when we look at the uh, announcements that uh, the European oil companies have made, when we read the fine uh, print, uh, it's not that these European oil companies are really going to uh, go beyond oil like 100%. Um, when you read the fine print, uh, what low carbon environment or economy means for them, it doesn't mean that they will really uh, stop producing oil or gas. For example, in the case of ENI, so this is their own statement on their website. So gas production by 2050 will make up a, about 85% of, of their total production. So 
that is a lot. I mean, natural gas is still, you know, uh, a little brother of the big oil. I mean, solar power companies are not going to produce natural gas. So uh, even European oil companies uh, will embrace, you know, natural gas as a huge component of the activities and operations. Um, and in terms of uh, reducing their um, carbon footprint, for example, forest conservation, you know, reforestation, etc., or CO2, CO2 capture will be a big part of their agenda, their programs. So it's not that they are going to go really beyond oil like 100%. They will find ways to reduce their carbon footprint, but at the same time, also remain as oil and gas companies. In, term, in terms of Econer, again, this comes from um, their website, their, you know, their statement. So near zero carbon uh, footprint in Norway only. See, uh, it's not that they are going to be, uh, you know, uh, zero percent carbon footprint everywhere in the world. So in Norway only, or electrification will be a big part, which means natural gas, energy efficiency, carbon capture storage, hydrogen. Where, where are we going to get hydrogen? Most probably from natural gas. So again, in the case of Econer, you see that, uh, you know, oil and gas is, will still be a big part of um, their operations. And also, uh, this carbon trade, you know, again, this is a fine print. When you read it, then you see that, you know, uh, low carbon footprint or zero uh, carbon footprint, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, no hydrocarbon. So there will be a trading uh, with other companies within the EU emission trading system. Uh, so how it works is something like this. So uh, EU um, has set a trading system for more 11,000 factories, power plants, you know, oil companies, etc. in Europe. And there's a cap emission for each company. So let's say if a company A uh, reaches its cap emission, fine. But company B remains below that cap emission. On the other hand, company C has exceeded the cap emission. So they can uh, buy uh, the remaining, you know, um, emission uh, from company B. So it's a kind of trade and the carbon trading is not really zero carbon footprint. I mean, still cap emission, it means you all these companies will still, you know, uh, uh, produce carbon dioxide as part of their activities. So they are taking this at zero. In reality, zero should be here, which is not possible to achieve. I mean, whatever we do, uh, even in the case of solar, in the case of wind, you know, in any uh, energy source that we want to use, there will be some activities which will produce carbon dioxide, et cetera, et cetera. So when you read the fine print, uh, you know, carbon trading is a big part of this um, zero carbon footprint. Now, the rift, the Atlantic rift, which I mentioned, it really boils down to oil versus climate uh, change. So that is the, and that's related to the energy transition. So uh, there are several scenarios about how, how much of oil production we will have, let's say in 2050. Um, this particular diagram comes from BP. Again, this was published uh, this year. So we are in 20, uh, 20, 2019. The data is actually for 2019. So we had a 100 million barrels of oil consumption every day, the world. So according to BP, this will actually continue uh, as business as usual, like until 2035, you know. So it's not that just in the next, uh, you know, five years or so, we are going to have, uh, you know, oil production uh, to be reduced by 50% or so. It's not going to happen that fast. 
And then there are scenarios. One is, so business as usual is the green line. So in 2015, 2050, we will have like 95 million barrels of oil, per, you know, that's the production per day. Uh, if there's a rapid transition, you know, the renewables become very important. Um, then yes, by 2050, you know, this uh, oil production will be reduced by 50%. If this net zero, again, this net zero is a very loaded term. You have to decode and deconstruct this to understand what it means. But anyway, in that case, you know, the oil production will uh, drop to 30 million barrels per day by 2050. So anyway, there is production declines in oil, depending on which scenario, which trajectory that the industrial the world will take. Another um, scenario, this is uh, from Econer, uh, basically showing the same concept, except that they use different terms. They use like uh, rivalry. This means strong oil. Oil is very uh, competent and there's a high demand for oil, lots of economic growth. Uh, so according to Econer, actually the uh, uh, production and consumption will increase to 120 million barrels a day. Then slow transition to 90 uh, and then low oil demand, then renewables will kick in. Then uh, we will have like half of what we are producing, we were producing in 2019. Anyway, these are some scenarios. Um, but how is that actually going to play out? I mean, um, so let me share with you two different scenarios. So we are in 2020, let's say, let's take 2019 as a benchmark. So we had like 100 million barrels, you know, uh, for a production and consumption. So with business as usual, we may actually have 120 million barrels you know, in, in 2050. But um, with rapid energy transition, it may be like 30 million barrels. So this is a huge, huge, huge reduction. But how is actually going to, I mean, how are we going to be able to do that? So one scenario, and this is, I would say more popular, you know, really the public wants to see this, etc. And I, I call this nirvana scenario that, you know, 2050, now we are living in a very peaceful, you know, uh, nirvana land, um, all the renewable solar, wind, geothermal, hydropower, et cetera, they have taken over and, you know, oil consumption has really declined, et cetera. But this is less likely because when we look at the energy density, of uh, oil and other resources. I mean, uranium has the largest energy density, nuclear power, okay. After that, we have crude oil, then coal and natural gas, okay. So solar and the wind and geothermal, uh, you name it, biofuel, etc. they have very less energy density. So to really replace oil, um, just imagine how much of solar power we have to generate, how much of wind, especially given their um, very low density. So that is very, you know, less likely, especially, you know, fossil fuels today, they account for 85% uh, of, you know, our energy consumption. So to replace that by renewables, is going to be a great cha a challenge. I would say even a miracle. So most probably what will happen is a scenario something like this. So energy efficiency will be very important part of this energy mix or energy transition. Plastic recycling will be very important. Remember that oil production is not only liquid, but also we produce lots of petrochemicals and plastic is a big part. I, uh, somewhere I read that, you know, today we only uh, recycle only 10% of, you know, plastic, which is really uh, a sad story, I would say. I mean, then the rest ends up in 
in the oceans, etc. So we have this plastic problem. So plastic recycling can itself, you know, uh, uh, lower our uh, production and consumption of oil. Renewables will be a very important part. Natural gas will be a very important part, even in the case of, uh, you know, European uh, oil and gas companies. And these together, renewables and uh, natural gas, uh, they will be the main drivers for electrification, electric cars, etc. cetera. Um, you know, power plants fueled by, uh, you know, renewables and natural gas, and also direct gasification of, you know, cars, you know, using natural gas rather than liquid oil. That may also be a very important um, technology to develop in the next three decades. But we should not also forget that the oil industry is not sitting idle. They will also evolve develop their own technology of carbon capture, storage, and usage. So that will also be a very important part of this energy transition. So energy transition is not a black and white. There will be several players, several technologies, and this is where geoscientists as well as engineers will contribute a lot. Uh, this is an uncharted territory. So there's lots of grounds and lots of opportunities uh, to address. So how does energy transition to low carbon 2050 is, what are the implications for geoscience and engineering? Well, petroleum is not going to go away because it is used uh, um, both as fuel, but also pe for petrochemicals and medicines. So that's not going to go away. Carbon capture and storage and reuse will expand. Natural gas will be a big part of the energy transition and that will be produced by petroleum companies. In sedimentary basins, petroleum companies who are operating in sedimentary basins, I think they will also try to exploit minerals like you know, rare earth metals, lithium, et cetera, helium, et cetera. We, we need all this uh, for you know, advanced technologies for, you know, digital technologies, for everything we use, uh, you know, uh, you know, strong magnets, etc. So this will also, what I call energy mineral nexus in sediment basins. Integrated geoscience engineering will be very important. Uh, innovative ways to reduce exploration and production costs per barrel. As I mentioned, this will be very important. Environmental aspects of the oil industry will be more pressing. So that is where geoscientists and engineers uh, will also contribute. Also, there's no shortage of oil. We know that. That peak oil uh, scenario, which uh, was very popular, you know, 20 years ago, uh, that has already proven to be wrong. Uh, we have lots of oil. We have lots of gas. There's no shortage of that. But we have lots of political issues, economic issues, and social issues. So I think that the soft sciences, like economy, history, geopolitics, will be a very important part of the oil industry um, uh, in the future. Then uh, data science, you know, artificial intelligence, learn, you know, machine learning uh, will also be very important. And also, uh, you know, education for future students in petroleum will integrate all this, you know, geoscience, so soft sciences, as well as engineering. Another divide is between uh, oil and natural gas. I think uh, I will skip this. You already know, uh, we kind of discussed this. So this will change the structure of the uh, you know, oil and gas companies, and then divide between oil and workforce. I mean, we have low enrollments in universities, uh, reduced budget for R&D and training, layoffs, low rates of hiring, retirement, lots of people are retiring. So there's this generational gap, uh, and that will uh, cause some troubles in this smooth transitional technology. Um, I think I will stop here for in the interest of time. 